welcome to this special in focus with 1.2 billion people and the world's largest population of youngsters under 35 many have spoken about the great demographic dividend that india is sitting on but the flip side of this dividend is the growing crisis created by a workforce that is not equipped to deal with the challenges of growth critics say that if we don't address it the demographic dividend can turn disastrous what needs to be done and what are the challenges Joining me today is Mr. M B Subaya, the former chairman of the Murugappa Group and chairman National Skill Development Corporation. Mr. Subaya, let me get you in here. You are heading this uh, National Skill Development Corporation, but my question to you, sir, is that in India, the, the questions being raised on the veracity of the figures that we've got. For example, unemployment statistics are people say is far higher, especially when you talk about disguised unemployment in areas, especially in rural areas, for instance. What is your assessment within the National Skill Development Corporation of what the problem or the scale of the problem is? One thing that we're trying to forget is the fact that a lot of people in this country are self-employed. I think that's a figure which is forgotten when we talk about employment. We always believe that it's got to be employed in a factory or in an office uh, or in a garment office. But then the majority of people in this country are employed, self-employed people. They don't work for a company. I think that number is huge, and that's true of every country. It's not only in India, but that's true of every country. So I, I mean, personally, I don't think the fa figures are exaggerated. If you take all of them into account, uh, particularly in the agricultural sector, majority of them are self-employed people, and uh, uh, the um, farmers go and help each other. But then they all are self-employed. So that being the case, I then think the numbers are uh, very exaggerated. Uh, and also, you got to take into account this 500 million includes a lot of retraining. You know, you don't just get there and stay there. I mean, if we take, for example, a plumber or, or an electrician, if he goes for training for three to six months and gets trained as a wireman, he should be able to, you know, end up by getting retrained. He can become a, you know, high tension wireman uh, after a few years. So he comes back for retraining. And that retraining also is included, in my opinion, in this 500 million, and therefore the numbers are not something to be worried about. So it is something that can be tackled. Uh, Would you let me get you in here, uh, Mr. Subaya? Uh, that's a very interesting point uh, Rajan raises, Mr. Subaya. So is it is the learning that a bottom-up approach is what is going to work when you talk about skilling and not a top-down approach necessarily? Because a lot of people also realize that progress can happen only with better jobs or or, or better skill sets. Is that what you're picking up from the ground? No, I think I think the both are true. I mean, you've got to look at it from both sides, not uh, not only from bottom up, but also from the top down in some cases. But if you look at the majority of people, you need to look at it from bottom up because that's what this country needs immediately. Just take domestic workers. Because of the supply demand situation, we have never looked at it as a skill in our in in this country. What you require is 10 million domestic service people every year in this country. And if you look at that, you can have six different levels of domestic uh, uh, people, starting off with just a person who comes to clean, uh, clean the house or uh, wipe the uh, furniture clean, to a person who is a cook or a elder care or a child care. There are several levels to which you can train them. So all that has been neglected all these years because it, you know supply was plenty, and you can go and pick them up in your village, come back and make them work. Today it's not true. So you've got to skill them. You take just the other example is, for example, the drivers. With the car productions going up and things like that, you need two million drivers. Even assuming only 50% of the cars require drivers, and the other uh, the trucks require three drivers per truck. So if you take that, you need two million drivers to be trained every year. And they're all, you know, these are all things which you have never attempted before in a systematic way. So that's really where I think the opportunity is. On a bottom-up basis, and also we should be able to give them. Apart from being a driver, after two three years, can you train him to be a mechanic? Can you train him to be a a good engineer? These are possible, and I think we have never looked at it in a systematic way all these years. And that's really why suddenly we see this problem staring at us, and we said, "Oh, 500 million," and we get you know uh, uh, pushed back kind of a thing. I don't think we should worry about the figures. We should look at it bottom up and start looking at the opportunities of training them and developing as many training centers as possible to train as many people as possible in any area. 
Mr. Subaya, let me toss that question to you. you. You not only head the National Skill Development Corporation, you are also chairman of one of the biggest industrial groups in the South. Do you think the onus is as much on the demand side to actually encourage the skill development from the ground up? Yeah, I, I think so. But I think the more important thing, as Mr. Ramdurai rightly pointed out, is the fact that once you're skilled, you've got to be willing to pay. And the, we are what we are trying to do in NSDC and through our partners, as well as talking to the employers, we're trying to encourage them to say at least 25% of your workforce should be accredited by the sector skills councils. The sector skills councils have been formed. We've formed so far 14 of them, of which six have already started working. They're setting the standards, not only the standards, but they're also setting training the trainers and also have the responsibility of setting the uh, accreditation levels for the different uh, jobs that they're recommending. So once that accreditation is done, then the payment starts, uh, the, once the employer starts paying, then automatically this will get, the movement will get a tremendous fill-up. Uh, a small, we did a small experiment in, the, uh, in Pune with Kredai in the building industry and there one day a week we requested them uh, or the employer, the contractors to release the people to be trained by Kredai themselves and we supported that training program and in fact within, on, the, on the shop floor, on the, on, the, on the site, on site and just one day a week. For, so they were paying them for six days Five days a week they were working on site. One day a week they were getting trained by trained trainers by Kredai. And you wouldn't believe the employers were all willing to, every contractor was willing to pay 20 to 30 percent higher wages for these trained people because they, they saved the money on productivity of the materials. So this is the kind of thing that we are proposing to as many employers as possible. So, Bea, let me ask you a very basic question. In India, every time you do something, there are also skeptics, and we have to cover that end of it. And the skeptics' view of what we are doing in the skill development arena is the fact that, you know, you're dealing with multiple bureaucracies, you're dealing with multiple ministries. Every ministry has its own skill development module. You're talking about public-private partnership, but hey, uh, private companies anyway do skill development because they are forced to do it. How can you get all these different uh, lines to talk the same language? Yes, there are. I mean, states, uh, various departments in the government, everybody. I think the more people do it, it's just again, like anything else, the survival of the fittest will happen after a little while. Right now, the more people do it, the better. But it, there is a lot of issues where uh, the only problem happens is when you have some training done by certain ministries which are free and therefore people just to while away their time they might go there but uh, when, part, when our partners um, entrepreneurs get into training they have problems of recruiting people because uh, they, they have to pay to come and get skilled and that's really when the problems and issues come up and I think that's a huge problem right now which we are facing with our partners are facing in ability to mobilize the NREG, which you mentioned earlier, is another uh, main competition when they get money for sitting and doing nothing or uh, shifting mud from one place to another, then why should I go for skilling is another uh, kind of a issue. We have had a lot of resistance from different areas, but we have now overcome all that. Mr. Subaya, how do you connect the dots over there if you want to train the trainers with the knowledge of industry and, uh, uh, you know, on-ground realities, how do you link it up together and uh, are there challenges that it throws up? No, that's, that's exactly the role of the sector skills councils that we are forming all over. Earlier, if you go back in history and see what was happening, the guilds were taking care of that. They set the standards, they set the um, um, uh, accreditation systems and things like that. Because everything was taken over by government and education was taken over by the government and then they set up the uh, accreditation systems, there was no connect between the industry or the user and the um, uh, young people. So now the sector skills councils are being formed and this will eventually start setting, as I said, the uh, accreditation systems and keep updating it because there will be a constant input from the industry because it's run the sector skills councils is run by the sector there, by the industry themselves. I think this is the whole idea. Mr. Subair, is that a big challenge, the mindset, the respect, the dignity for labor? Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge mindset problem there. But I think 
uh, again, you know, with the, uh, time would sort that out and my belief because once we started the program and the uh, publicity program, first of all, there is a mindset problem in terms of just the uh, blue collar work itself. There's a mindset problem in terms of taking a job uh, 30 kilometers away from your home. These are all mindsets which are the first ones to tackle. I don't think we can run before we can learn to walk. I think we are in the process of learning to walk right now, and I don't think we should worry about running at this stage. Right. So I think.